Hello there, fight friends. MMA Andy Cotterell here, and welcome to the MMA show for the 26th of February, 2024. This was a great past weekend for me. I was uh, fortunate enough to attend LFA 177 in Niagara Falls, New York. I'm pretty lucky and grateful for the opportunities I get covering the sport. I've been to so many great Canadian MMA promotions across the country, met so many terrific people. This was my first time attending LFA's media. I'd, I'd attended one or two before as a fan, had a good time there. And I just have to say, I was treated like a uh, like a like a like a family member when I got there. I met uh, Ryan Bevins, who was the communications manager, took me under his wing and just introduced me to so many people. Uh, Ed Sorez, who you might know as Anderson Silva, Silva's former manager, he's the COO of uh, of of uh, LFA, and I got to meet uh, Leoto Machida and Sven Bean, the president. Whole bunch of terrific people. Just had a great great overall time. So thank you, Ryan, if you're watching this. Probably not, but thank you anyway. It was. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. All right, let's start talking about that event, LFA. If you'd like to go to the MMA uh, upcoming fight section with me and you can follow along with me, let's go on over here to MMA.ca, click Upcoming Fights, and you'll take a look up here. Uh, I kept them here just for you to look at right now. There were three Canadians that fought. Uh, the first fight of the night was Luke Roberts from Niagara Top Team versus Farman Hasanov. This was an absolute war of a fight. Uh, if you don't know either of these fighters, you just need to know that for this fight, they were two clearly wherever they come from or wherever their situation is, they're probably used to being top dogs and they're probably used to beating people up and they went at each other and tried to implement their game plans and it just it didn't work out. Both of them went forward like bulls, both of them, neither of them receded like matadors and they just went at each other for three full rounds. It was fantastic to watch two super tough guys slugging it out a lot of skill though too a lot of uh everything right there wasn't much sorry not not much groundwork but uh they were on the feet a lot some clinch and uh it was just f fantastic i think i'm probably saying the same thing over and over such a good fight if you ever get a chance to watch it i'm not sure how we're gonna get a chance maybe it'll be released on youtube or something uh, it was on the undercard Unfortunately for Luke, he, it was, he lost a decision to that. Uh, it was a unanimous decision, decision which I, I disagree with somewhat. Um, I thought Luke clearly won the third round, so at least one and, and possibly the second. But, uh, you know, sometimes that's what, what happens. Luke actually went up a weight class and took this fight short notice. So warrior and stud for, for Luke. Good job, man. Um, you know, wicked fight. All right, let's go on to Sierra Lee Dinwoody from House of Champions in Stony Creek, Ontario. She fought Hope Chase. Now, this is really interesting. This is kind of funny, actually. When I first saw the matchup announced for, for this, I registered the name Hope Chase, and I just sort of put it in my memory banks and didn't think too much of it. As I got closer, when I got to the event, I saw more of the promotional material, and I spent more time looking up Hope Chase, actually in the days leading up to it. And I knew she looked familiar. Something seemed familiar and I looked at her fight record and I hadn't seen any of her fights as far as I knew and when I saw her uh uh when, when I got there and I saw like promotion material and stuff and saw her face I knew there was something up so I did a more of a thorough deep dive on her and she she, I, she reminded me of somebody that I'd seen in the past and I know exactly who she reminded me of she reminded me of uh the girl that Jasmine Jazdevicious fought in her pro debut in I'm going to say Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. No, it was Pittsburgh. This is like three or four years ago. My wife at the time and I went down and, and joined Niagara Top Team and watched Jasmine fight live to that. And her opponent, uh, Jasmine's opponent at the time, was a really interesting character. She had these kind of interesting mannerisms. And, you know, you were kind of questioning, like, does she, I, I don't know. I don't want to say too much, but she was unusual. Anyway, this girl, Hope Chase, reminded me of her. So I took a look, and sure enough, they're sisters. So Jasmine's first pro fight and uh, Sierra's opponent the other night, there were sisters. And it was once that I registered that, it was so obvious, man. They were so close. Hope Chase, when she came out, she did this thing uh, staring across the cage from, from Sierra where she was shaking her leg. Like, it was almost like it was twitching. She just stood there, side on to Sierra, and, like, gazing at her like a, like, a, like a predator stares at their prey, and her leg was twitching almost. I think it was on purpose. It must have been on purpose, but I, I don't really know. I'd, I'd like to get a video and, and show you, but it was really unusual. Once again, there's that word unusual. Anyway, this was a terrific fight. And the thing about uh, fighters, and you hear me say this all the time, is that sometimes it takes a, a handful of fights or, or sometimes a lot of fights in order to get your, your, your questions about fighters answered, right? So what I mean by that is if you've got a good striker, 
uh, who strikes and, and wins by striking all the time. If you never see them grapple, well, the question is, can they grapple? What happens if they get somebody who's really good, takes them to the ground? Uh, so these were the questions I had about Sierra. I, I was really fortunate to see Sierra's first two pro fights at Prospect Fighting Championship. She won both of those. She looked really good. Um, and so but the question was, could she survive on the ground? And afterward, after this fight, the uh, the LFA people said, we didn't know she could grapple. And uh, I guess she clearly can. This was a this was a terrific fight, once again, between the two ladies. A uh, lot of time on the feet, a lot of time on the ground, and Sierra looked good in both. Right off the bat, so Sierra, if you don't know her, she's tall, she's lanky, she's rangy. She's probably going to have a reach advantage over like 99.9% .9 of all her opponents she's ever going to face. And of course, that when you're, you have that advantage, you want to implement it. And she tried at the start, uh, you know, using her, her legs and kicks to, to keep Hope Chase away, but Hope was just like underneath and straight in and, and, and advanced on her really, really quickly. Sierra did a good job uh, counteracting that on the feet. There's some good scrapping, and they spent a lot of time on the ground where Sierra looked really good. She didn't look out of place. She had some submission attempts. She had like an arm triangle choke attempt. She had, I think, I think she had an arm bar, uh, and, and definitely a Rinica choke attempt. Uh, she wasn't able to sub uh, secure the submissions, but that's one of those things. If you train, you know, sometimes it's 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 a matter of of like micrometers, like very small adjustments. You can be really close to getting a submission, but you're off on an angle, just a tiny little bit, a degree or, or a small bit of distance. And it just takes those small little finesse uh, micro movements to, to put yourself in the right position to get the submission. And I think that Sierra is really close, man. Like she, she was probably not too far away from getting some of those submissions. It didn't help that Chase or uh, Hope Chase was, was really tough and really uh, she had a lot of grit. She, you can tell she's, she's a fighter for sure. So Sierra looked really good. She got the got the decision victory, got her hand raised, and I know LFA was really excited by her. They were surprised. They said they didn't know uh, she would be able to do that on the ground, and uh, I'm sure they'll bring her back. So awesome job, Sierra. Uh, next up, we had in the co-main event, we had Shannon Clark. Oh, by the way, Sierra was brought up to the main event after the main card after uh, one of the other fighters was injured, so she got a lot of eyes. She was on UFC Fight Pass, and that'll probably do her well, and you, you probably got to see her fight. Next up in the co-main event, we had Shannon Clark from Lethbridge. She fought Tiny Lopez uh, for the flyweight title. Uh, for somebody who, who's who got the nickname, the MMA Barbie, and she's, she's uh, you know, got a look. She's blonde hair, blue eyed, and her voice is very light, and she's very friendly, great smile. People who don't know her might look at her and make assumptions, thinking that she's just a, like a, not a serious fighter. Let me tell you, she is a very serious fighter. She looks so good. She ended up uh, uh, choking out Tiny with a bulldog choke partway through early-ish into the second round. And if you don't know what a bulldog choke, it's basically just like a school year, what you did in like grade two or something. You, you know, you go to your friend and you put your arm around their neck. Well, um, well, you can't see me doing that. But anyway, Shannon uh, got the bulldog choke on and just leveraged her body back and leaned it back. And you can see Tiny's face go from normal skin color to, 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 to pink, to darker pink, to purple. And she was... She was choked right out, and it was a fantastic win for Shannon. Kind of cute uh, uh, post-fight interview in the cage afterwards. Uh, I'm not going to tell you about it now because we're going to talk with Shannon. Uh, I spoke with her right after the fight, so let's see what she had to say. Hello there, fight friends. MMA Andy Cotterill here at the Seneca Casino in Niagara Falls, New York at LFA 177, where Lethbridge's Shannon Clark just became the LFA Women's Flyweight Champion. Or Flyweight, yeah, congratulations, Shannon. Thank you so much. So, uh, you must feel terrific. I know the answer already, but you must feel so terrific. Yeah, I'm very surprised and I'm very happy. Yeah. What, uh, are you the kind of fighter where you build yourself up to, to the event and now that it's over all your emotion, just let go? Yeah, uh, it's a little bit of a relief now, and um, honestly, I'm really excited to get back and keep training. I don't think I took really any injuries, so back to the drawing board. Yeah, that was a it was almost like a very fast fight. It was in the second round. You you beat her with a bulldog choke. You actually choked her unconscious. Uh, you said after the fight, it was something actually funny in the post fight interview. They said, "Hey, Shannon, you choked her out with it. We didn't think you'd beat her by a choke," and you said something like, "I didn't know I could do that." Yeah, no, I've, I've done it in training with the boys, but I didn't know I could pull it out in real life in a fight. So that's awesome. I'm very grateful for that. Tell, me, tell us uh, your thoughts on how you saw the fight or how you remember the fight. Or you or do you, like you said, you maybe blacked out and you don't really remember and you have to rewatch? Yeah, I'll definitely have to rewatch. Um, I remember parts of the fight, but I don't remember everything. Um, I... 
one thing I know I didn't do as good is my coach was yelling at me to get up, but I didn't feel like she was very strong on mm -hmm. the ground. Um, not Her weight was nothing like I was used to. Um, so I'll have to have a talk with my coach about that one so I don't get in trouble. But um, I wasn't in a hurry to get up, which I know you're supposed to, but I was comfortable on my back because she mm -hmm. wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was in any danger of a submission at yeah, that yeah. time. I was still able to hit and do stuff like that. Probably should learn to get up and listen to my coach, but I just was like, well, I'm fine. Let me just see if I can get, push her head down. Can I flip her? Can I do something like that? So that's something I should probably look back and rewatch and see if I was actually in danger, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. Well, it worked out for you because that's where you got her. You're on the ground for that choke. Yes, no, yeah, I was. And then, um, yeah, I saw it there and just took it, and that's one of the chokes that at or, or at um, the station that when I get on the boys, they can't get out of. So I was like, well, if they can't, she can't. So yeah. squished her as much as I can and yeah. hoped it worked. It was kind of weird, or not weird, uh, interesting though. You're a Canadian. We're in the United States. Your opponent was a Brazilian, but the fans really seemed to take to you. Like I had a, a row of people right behind me when you were walking out, and a lot of people were cheering for you. Yeah, um, I don't really hear a whole lot when I'm walking out, so I actually didn't know if I had anyone cheering for me or not. I don't know if I just get tunnel vision. Um, the only people I really hear are my coaches, actually, and the odd time I'll hear her coach. Obviously, I didn't understand what, what they were saying, but that's all I hear. I actually don't hear anyone in the stands. Really? Yeah, no, nothing. Um, one thing I really noticed about you afterwards, we met in the back in the elevator, service elevator, and we, we came up just now. The, when you walk through the crowd, it's like everybody really seems to take to you and they, they, they're, they're affectionate toward you as, a, as fans are to, to star athletes. Is that something that you, uh, and you, you receive it very well, like you're very, very friendly, you're very outgoing, you're very kind to all of them. You even gave time, like a couple young men approached you and you gave them time. I mean, uh, I think that's a smart way to go, you know, make sure the fans come back and make sure they want to support you in the future. Oh, absolutely. Um to me, if the fans don't really like you, people won't really care to watch you and maybe p promotions don't want you back then. So yeah. to me, you got to give back to the fans. You got to be there for everyone who wants to take the time to watch you. It's the least you can do. Yeah. Well, LFA has no choice but to bring you back now. I mean, I know. two fights with them, two wins. Now you're the champion. Yeah, that's unreal. Maybe I can play my cards and get somewhere cool to fight next time. So how much preparation did you do uh, looking into the LFA current roster and seeing other opponents out there, potential opponents for you? have never done that. So <laughs> I usually leave that to my coach to do that. Yeah. I just get told who I fight. One thing I like about LFA is that it travels from city to city. So, you know, you fought in Colorado before, you fought in New York now. Could be Minnesota somewhere, probably like Minnesota next time. Could be anywhere. Yeah, could be anywhere. Hopefully somewhere warm. Well, well warm, warm weather's coming anyway. Exactly. So somewhere warm would be great. <laughs> All right, Shannon, I'm going to let you get to your, uh, your, your icing, your treat, and your, so you can get a sore tummy from gorging on it. Uh, before we go, is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, I would just like to thank everyone that has supported me, uh, my friends and family. I would love to thank my training partners. They go unnoticed. Um, they're not actual MMA fighters, so no one really takes and acknowledges how much work they put in. I would not be here if it wasn't for them, and definitely my coach. He puts hours and hours and hours into me, and... All I can do is win for him, so. What's your coach's name? Joel Ardorsky. So, yay. <laughs> well, Shannon, from uh, the people watching at MMA.ca and all your Canadian fans and all your American fans, too, your new American fans, congratulations, champ, and we will see you fight next time. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic win for Shannon. Uh, I think she's at the point now where she, I think it probably served her well to get a couple more fights in LFA, something like that. If you don't know, LFA is, is well known as being one of the premier feeder organizations to the UFC. A lot of fighters go to the UFC from, from LFA and others like CFFC. And now increasingly more in Canada, we have uh, BFL and BFL Unified and Samurai MMA are all on UFC Fight Pass. So we're going to start to see more of them get their fighters into the UFC, I'm sure. Uh, so Shannon could probably be served by those, but I think she's probably at the point now where I wouldn't be surprised that she called, if she got called up for a contender series. She's at that level uh, and she looked, she looked really good. So uh, congratulations, Shannon, on that. Um, LFA travels around the country. They have events in, in Minnesota and Colorado and other places. So I'm not sure when they'll be back to um, Niagara Falls. And when they are, I'll be there for sure. Okay, let's go on now to we had two other fights, uh, Canadians fighting this past weekend. Uh, we had Bruce Rusan and Phil Lozon fought in North Dakota at Throne MMA 3. Uh, I just looked after the event. 
and there was another Canadian that got put on after I, ma I made my list. So uh, I, I didn't have any information on him. It was really difficult to get information on the results of this fight. However, I was able to find out that Bruce Rissan won by rear naked choke over Isaiah Spitzer. I think Isaiah Spitzer had a rear naked choke on, on him earlier in the fight. And uh, and Bruce was able to, to escape and then put one on himself. And he won the fight. So good job, man. And Phil Lozon, unfortunately, lost his fight. Uh, but I don't think it was a blowout. I think it was a was close as far as i know if uh this brings up a point i don't know everything clearly and I, I can only know what i can find scouring the internet and when i talk with people they give me they give me sort of a little bit of intelligence or, or in the military they call it tipper information uh so if you have any tipper information you know anyone fighting or you have any canadian mma events or any canadians fighting somewhere that i don't have on my on my upcoming fight section on mma please reach out let me know and i'll make sure it's included and, and find out more Okay, so this weekend we have one fight in Canada, one event happening, and that is Fight Quest 54 in Kananakwe, Quebec. This is an amateur MMA event, and uh, I'm opening up now at the Knights of Columbus Hall, and the main event is Sean Irving versus Isaac Hebert for the Bantamweight Championship. Bunch of other amateur fights, so those are always exciting. If, you, if you've never been to an amateur MMA event, uh, if you're in a part of the country that has them, or even just a local MMA event, MMA event, I highly encourage you to do it, right? Like, everyone you see fight in the UFC, they didn't have their first fight in the UFC. They started somewhere else, or, or Bellator, or PFL, right? They have to get there somehow. So for me, one of the things I love is seeing a fighter who starts off being 0-0 and, and becomes 1-0 and 2-0 and 3-0, and, 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 and pretty soon they're fighting for a championship belt in their local promotion, and then they're in the UFC or fighting somewhere in the world for, for, for a lot of recognition. Uh, give it a shot. Try it. There's lots. Once again, go to uh, the upcoming fight section on MMA.ca, and you'll see down here I have a list of all the MMA events in Canada up for the rest of the year. So as far as I know, I'm, I think I have think I have all of them. Well, I do have all of them for what I know. Uh, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but uh, uh, if you want to find something near you, go there and check it out. Okay, what else do we have? All right, so uh, we have some exciting news for TriStar West Island co-owner Xavier Alawi, known as the Breadman. He's had a lot of success in the past several years fighting at UAE Warriors, uh, and uh, he has been signed to the PFL. So the PFL just had their... Uh, PFL champion versus Bellator champion first event over the past weekend. And so they are getting closer, if they're not there already, to becoming a fully one organization from the two combining. Uh, so I don't know when Xavier will be fighting, but I expect it to be sometime in 2024. He is joining his TriStar teammate, uh, Tariq Ismail, in the PFL. That makes 10 Canadian fighters fighting in the PFL. And if you want to go up here to the Canadian fighter section, you'll see that I've got a list of all the Canadian UFC fighters. Uh, and down here, the Canadian PFL fighter. So Xavier Lowy, I still have to make a page for him. Uh, Tariq Ismail. One thing, I, I don't know if Xavier will follow Tariq in that Tariq was signed to PFL MENA. I'm not sure if it's pronounced MENA or MENA, but it's M-E-N-A. And it stands for Middle East, North Africa. So that is a really smart move by PFL. Whereas the UFC, as great as it is, it's mostly United States centric, right? Like they do have events in other countries. They do some traveling around, but for the most part, they're based out of the United States. Most of their main main cards are in the United States. Everything's United States. PFL, if they can implement like a more of a worldwide fan base, I mean, this is going to look really good for them and 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 help them grow quite substantially, I think. Okay, you'll see that we've got uh, ten fighters on here for the PFL. I will mention that now. Aaron Jeffrey. So Aaron Jeffrey uh, from Niagara top team. He uh, is scheduled to fight Fabian Edwards at Bellator 302 in Belfast, Ireland on March 22nd. It was announced that the winner of this fight will be the number one contender for the PFL middleweight title. Well, this past weekend in the PFL champions versus Bellator champions, Bellator champion, Johnny middleweight champion, Johnny Eblen beat uh, PFL light heavyweight champion, uh, Impa Kasangane, who went down to middleweight for this fight, so Johnny beat Impa. Now that means Johnny is the PFL middleweight champion. So if he doesn't have a fight between, uh, he probably, well, he won't, it's too close. So if Aaron wins his fight against Fabian, it should be Aaron taking on Johnny for the PFL middleweight champion. Whoa, what an opportunity. This is huge. So uh, still too early to know anything yet. I mean, Aaron still has to have his fight and win his fight. So Good luck, Aaron. I'm sure you've got a whole country behind you cheering on for you. And actually, probably not just the whole country, not just Canada. Aaron spends about half his time training at Killcliff MMA down in Florida. 
and he's got a, a, a lot of support there, I'm sure. So I'm sure they'll be rooting for Aaron as well. Well, Team Canada, uh, wherever that fight happens. Okay, let's go on now to, okay, back to the events. We're going to take a look at Fight League Atlantic number 14. It's funny how the more I do uh, these shows, the more I'm learning things. And one of the things I'm learning, especially coming from where I was posting on Instagram before and had a time limit, I was trying to go so fast. One of the most difficult things for me is to, to slow down and just, you know, take my time. I can slow down, take a breath. This is on YouTube, man. I can talk for as long as I want almost, right? So just uh, let me slow down for you. All right, back to MMA events. Let's go to FLA 14. You will see that that is in Elmstall, Nova Scotia on April 13th. And they have announced, well, they haven't announced, but I have found out that Christian Savoy Tiger will be fighting uh, at welterweight against TBA, the dreaded TBA. You know, TBA is all over the place, to be announced. Um, Christian Savoy, it's a, it's a shame that such a dedicated athlete who puts in so much time and effort, and it's not just Christian, it's, it's other fighters too, puts time and effort into these fights and for whatever reason doesn't actually get to fight due to circumstances outside their control. If you remember at FLA 13, uh, Christian was scheduled to fight in the main event at, at welterweight and his opponent showed up, uh, made, well, didn't make weight. He was a little, he was a little bit over, but still he was at the weigh-ins and it looked like the fight was on. And then that night the opponent had to go to the hospital with kidney failure and Christian didn't get the fight. So it, as non-fighters, we just have to look at that and empathize with, with everyone involved, right? Like to some degree, we empathize with a, with a guy who went to the hospital because he wanted to fight. But on the other hand, you know, they should have been more prepared. Uh, but you definitely have to empathize with Christian, right? He's a professional. He showed up. He was ready to fight. And it didn't get to happen. So let's knock on wood. I said that when I interviewed Christian last time for FLA 13. We kind of laughed about it because it was looking like the fight was going to happen. And so we were like laughing, joking, saying, knock on wood, this fight happens. It didn't happen. So knock on wood, let's hope Christian Savoy actually gets the fight. Uh, just announced today, Rob Logan versus Matt McDonald at middleweight. And this fight between Jake Kelly and Gino uh, Galapagos was supposed to be at 13, I think. And I don't remember why, but that didn't happen. So we got moved up now. Okay, let's go up now and take a look at BTC. We have two BTC fights that we're aware of right now and some things to talk about. BTC 23 at 16th of March in Kingston. Uh, well, right now, this is what the fight card looks like with the proposed main event is going to be Xavier Nash versus Tyler Grimsley. I say proposed because this may not be the main event. I know that BTC is actively trying to get, I, I can't say names, um, I, at least one half of the name, if it happens, you'll be very familiar with. Uh, I think it's the opponent they're, they're working on and, and they've asked me not to say anything until they get this, this signed. So if it ends up being Xavier versus Tyler, uh, that should be a really good fight. I don't know Tyler all that well, but I know Xavier is, a, is an exciting fighter to watch. He's really skilled uh, and he's, he's, he's a really good fighter. So um, that would be good regardless. But if they get this other fight with, I will tell you that it's a, this other fighter, uh, at least one half has fought in the UFC before. So it's exciting. Uh, I'm not going to say weight class either. Uh, too early to tell. Once, uh, like I say, once once I know, once I find out, you'll find out. If you take a look down here, this is what I put in when I initially got the, the news a couple months ago. The BTC is having a heavyweight tournament. Those were the fighters at the time. And you'll notice I said BT or the heavyweight tournament being pushed onto the June card. So let's take a look at the June card now. And that is BTC 24 in Burlington on June 8th. And... The only thing we know is is seven heavyweight contenders. So we need one more to have a full full three rounds. Uh, wouldn't it be cool, though, if you had uh, like a one-night tournament like they used to have back in the day? So fighters have to win three fights to win the whole thing. I mean, man, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do it, but uh, as a fan, it'd be fun to watch. So these are who we have, are we aware, are aware of fighting. We have Mike Mead, Lorenzo Celis, Bogdan Kodak, Tim Kronk, Lester Calderon, Javad Majub, and Sayed Selezeda. I, I hope I said that said that even a little bit close. So say it. Uh, I apologize if I got it wrong. So that should be fun. Um, heavyweight tournament. People like watching the big men fight. It's it's tough with with heavyweights because the uninitiated fan look at heavyweights and they think of boxing like they think of the heavyweight boxers of great and they they expect that heavyweight fights are going to be the most exciting. 
we've learned over time, my personal opinion anyway, and the UC learned this when even when they didn't have the lower weight classes years ago, that lighter weight fighters are often much more exciting to watch because they don't have all that mass to move around. They, they, they can be fast. They're speedy. They have really amazing uh, cardio often. Sometimes you don't see that in heavyweight fights. But I know that a couple of these guys, well, more than a couple, they are they are very skilled and they and they have a lot of uh, expertise in their field. Like some of these guys are, are wrestler heavy, like world class wrestlers for sure. And there's something about the heavyweight fights when they just have those, you know, meat mittens get swung around with uh, with a huge amount of force and knock their opponent off their feet. I mean, there's nothing that beats that when you see like a huge heavyweight knockout. So uh, this will be fun, and and once we know more, I'll, I'll let you know, of course. Okay, let's go on now to BFL 80, and that is in Vancouver on May 9th. We had very successful BFL 79 a few weeks ago, and they only have a few of their undercards fights named, and I'll get back to one of these in a second. Uh, but they did announce yesterday that their featherweight champion, Radley De Silva, who just beat uh, Maxime Susi at BFL 79, he will be facing Caleb Moctezuma for the featherweight championship, to defend his featherweight championship. Fa- absolutely fantastic fight. So Radley De Silva, um, if you just look on the internet, you'll see that he is uh, a capoeira fighter, air quotes, capoeira fighter. Um, he comes from a long line uh, of capoeira fighters. He trained out of Axe Capoeira in Vancouver, world-renowned Axe Capoeira with uh, with some amazing mentors and his, his family. Um, but if you'll ask Radley, uh, he will tell you that he's more of a well-rounded fighter. He's been training his whole life, even though if you look at his record, he, he fights pretty sporadically and, and not all that often. It looks like with this, he's getting on like a more of a, a rapid, rapid track to fight. And he's really skilled across everything, right? Like you saw that with Maxime. He, he had some really good wrestling, was able to close the distance and, and negate any of Maxime's striking. Um, so Radley's excellent. And Caleb Moctezuma, man, I think we're at, at the point now where it's been a few years where a lot of fight promotions are bringing in a lot of Mexican fighters. And it's really easy to get jaded uh, and think that Mexican fighters are being brought in to lose because uh, it, I, you know, I haven't done the percentages, but I get the impression that a lot of the Mexican fighters lose when they come up here. Caleb is one of the two, uh, along with Sylvester Sanchez, that they are, they're not losing anybody, man. I mean, sure, they're going to lose fights. Uh, Sylvester lost to Luke Roberts a while back, but that was a really close fight. Caleb is a fantastic fighter. I first saw him in person when he beat Michael Imperato at Prospect uh, last year, the year before. Uh, if you don't know Michael Imperato, Michael just got signed. Well, I don't know if he's actually signed anything, but after his last unified showing, he got uh, the eye of the UFC. So he should be in the contender series somewhat soonish, whenever that may be. And Michael Imperato is, is a tough, tough, skilled fighter who is just like a buzzsaw when he's in there so the fact that caleb beat him got a win over him that's that's huge even right there so if caleb wins th- this is not a given for the canadian right like Radley's gonna have to win this fight if he wants to win the fight if you know what i mean uh so i'm excited we'll see how that goes uh, we've also got mac larson um versus once again tba rears his ugly head mac larson was supposed to fight who was it i think that was at the last unified oh it was supposed to fight uh Zach Powell, I think. And then Zach Powell ended up uh, finding somebody else to fight after Mac pulled out for whatever reason. Okay, uh, that's it for news, I think. Uh, however, if you take a look up here this weekend, we do have TriStar Gyms, Eamon Zahabi, fighting Javid Basharat at UC Fight Night in Vegas. I had a chance to speak with Eamon about this fight. And uh, he's uh, he's... If you don't know him too well, he's very similar to his brother, Faraz, who's the owner and, and head coach at TriStar MMA. Um, you know, sometimes I hesitate bringing up because I don't bring up the fact they're brothers. I mean, you know, but, you know, I want Eamon to be able to uh, rest on his own laurels, not his brothers. So, But I bring it up because they're very similar in that when you speak with them, they're both very thoughtful and introspective. And... One thing I've said for years, even not just with mixed martial arts, have you ever noticed sometimes when you're speaking with somebody that you get the feeling they're just kind of waiting for you to stop speaking so they can start speaking? And it's like you're not, you don't even have to be there. They're, they're almost having a conversation with themselves, right? Like, whatever, like if you and I were having a conversation, hopefully when you say something, I'm going to consider what you said 
and that'll influence my response. Oftentimes these days, I find that doesn't happen. Like you can almost see somebody watching your lips and waiting for you to stop speaking so they can start talking, right? Like you don't even have to be there. With uh, the Zahabi brothers, they are very clearly paying attention to you as a person and thinking about what you say. And for me as a, as a, as a human, not even just an, as an MMA journalist, it's really nice to speak to somebody like that because, um, yeah, it just makes you feel like you are uh, being listened to, makes you feel like you're important. And additionally, they have interesting thoughts. So, uh, I mean, we talked about a lot of things. It's funny. We actually had a, <laughs> we had a conversation before the interview that was probably longer than the interview itself. Just a really interesting guy, a uh, really good fighter. 36 years old, and I think uh, Javid is like 28. And I don't really pay attention too much to, to, to odds because odds, I think a lot of people get odds on fighting wrong. So at least one odds maker I saw, Eamon is like a, like a minus or a, a plus 500. I don't know, whatever the one is where you're the underdog. So Eamon is, is listed as a huge underdog in this fight. Well, what some people don't get about bets is that the betting organizations, they, they make these odds so that you will bet on a fighter so that the betting place will take your money, right? So they want you to bet on somebody else. So if they show that Javid is, you know, uh, 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 like a, has a huge advantage, they're going to hope that you bet on him so that if he loses, they can make money. I'm sure I'm simplifying it, and I, I don't claim to be a, a, a betting expert. I'm really not, so don't come at me, please. But uh, Eamon is not a, you know, you can call him an underdog if you want, but he's he's got a history of finishing, especially in the past four or five fights. And you take a look at Javid, and he's gone through after his Contender Series win, he, uh, he's he got decisions. So, you know, it's funny how you can make almost any data mean what you want it to mean, right? Like, could the fact that Javid has got like three um, decisions in a row mean something? Maybe. Could it not mean something? Maybe. I don't know. You've got to figure it out for yourself. But uh, Ayman definitely is uh, is is going to be in this fight. So let's uh, let's uh, have that uh, conversation with him now and see what he has to say. Ayman Zahabi, welcome to the MMA show. How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you, man. It's great to be on. I don't know if our interview is actually going to uh, meet up the expectations I have from our pre-interview, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was great to get to know you a little bit more, a little bit deeper. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's funny how, you know, when you know people through the internet, I, I truly believe that relationships to the internet, and when I say relationships, I, I don't mean romantic or any of that stuff, but like any type of interaction with somebody else, that's a relationship, right? Like an interpersonal yeah, of course, relationship yeah. of some type. So I know so many people and so many fighters through the internet who I might have met only once in my life, if I've ever met them at all. But I still feel like there's like a deeper connection with a lot of them at some point because, you know, the, the internet is real. The internet is a real method of communication. Well, yeah, of course. And, I mean, you're getting to know a version of them at least. Yeah. Even though you don't know them in their completion as a person, but you, you get to see what they put out there. And from the interviews that you, you get to do because you get to interview a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. it, but it's uh, it's kind of curious because you don't really truly get to know a person in general, like not even through the internet. Like we have the people that we know, and I'll use know in quotation marks because what does that mean to know somebody, right? Like, so for example, I just got divorced about a year and a half ago. Nobody knew. Okay. I don't post that stuff on social media. I don't, I don't share, I don't overshare because I don't like it when people do that. I, I get annoyed when people do that. So when I think I made a post like a year after it happened, um, yeah. people were surprised. They're like, what? How did this happen? And yeah. because they, they might know me, but they don't, they don't know me. So like yeah. the, the way I know you or the way you know me, that's only what you want me to see and what I want you to see. So there's yeah, all sorts what of you stuff. put out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've got a whole internal monologue. Uh, we've got a whole internal process that sometimes, uh, depending on the person, I guess, for me personally, not a lot of people get to know everything. I don't, is that similar for you? Do you keep stuff close to your heart or are you a, are you a sharer? Yeah, well, online, I, I put more like things that are like uh, easy to share. I don't really go super deep in uh, all my stuff, but 
I am going to start a YouTube channel after this fight. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm going nice. to throw that out there. Awesome. That, uh, you know, basically, I'm going to spend more time, I guess, on camera, like you're saying, so people can get to know me more in a different light, too. And basically, my idea is to just start off with, like, you know, ordering the the UFC pay-per-views and do, like, mm -hmm. an alternative alternative commentary and, mm -hmm. like, chat with the people online as the fights are happening, too. And I'm going to have guests, you know, like other UFC fighters. I'm going to have my wife on. I'll have different friends on and whatever. And then maybe, like, people will get to know me more from, like, a different angle. Like, I, I might be a casual watching the show, you know? You might get to yeah, see yeah. me from, from, from something different. Because, you know, when I do these interviews, a lot of the times it's very similar questions all the time, right? So they're only, yeah, like, yeah. hearing one, one side of me, you know? Mm -hmm. not, not everybody's getting the 360 view of who I am as a person, right? So that's what's interesting. And, like, now, as I'm getting more popular, I'm getting interviewed by different people, and different people have different styles. So I get, like different types of questions so that's kind of like rounding out my image for people too online which is mm -hmm. nice too right for sure what was the catalyst for the youtube channel i just feel like you know like to to get popular you're gonna have to put out more more uh content like we're in, a, we're in the era of mm -hmm. content and it seems that like it's interesting how like people on youtube or like these influencers they're just influencers because they put out the content yeah, not necessarily yeah. because they achieved anything really special in a way other than views. Mm -hmm. You know, like they do funny, wacky stuff. Like you see now, like, do you know these, these like, um, like they're obviously fake prank videos, but you know, like they have these like husband and wife videos where they, they, they prank each other, they shoot each other with these guns or they have like confetti yeah. come out. Yeah. But it's like, man, you know, these are setups and you know, they're fake, but they get millions upon millions of views. Yeah. And these people are famous for like, nothing special and i like i feel like i worked so hard on my craft that maybe if i produce consistent content maybe i'll become popular too and then maybe that'll help me with like getting more sponsors and getting a better pay in the ufc and stuff like that like it could be a catalyst to like get me more one step closer to financial freedom eventually yeah i think that's smart because uh, as great as ufc is in a lot of things they do tend to promote fighters that they think can be a draw, right? Like if you're a big name yeah. as opposed to a small or a no name, I mean, the big name is going to get more, more action and, and more people and more eyeballs. And that all leads to money. It always boils down to money. So that's probably a smart thing yeah. to do. Yeah. I'm going to take a chance, you know, like even like, let's say for example, Sean O'Malley, you know, he does those prank videos too. And those like videos where he goes and asks questions to people on the street. He's done all kinds of, all kinds of videos to produce, like to get views, 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 views. And then what they do is after doing all the, the those videos to get the numbers up, then they turn it into a podcast. Yeah. Because once you've become popular, you don't have to make those prank videos anymore. Now people want to know your opinion. So it's like I, I'm finding like that's the arc that people are going through. You know? So I'd be like, okay, I'll just I don't wanna like I don't necessarily wanna do prank videos because it's not like my style. Mm -hmm. But I think I could do like the commentary stuff for the fighting. Cause I also did like the commentary for United MMA the other time. Yep. And I, I enjoyed I it. Yep. yep. So I was like, you know what? That's something easy I can do. And like, I know I've been in, you know, in, tr in training for like twenty years. So I have a lot of info inside me, man. And I can, I can read fights. I can give fighters advice. You know, maybe people can rewatch it and get advice out of the, out of how I would perceive it as a coach watching these guys fight. You know, there could be some gems in there for people too, in general. So I might be able to clip that up later. You know, so just like I want to build a following on YouTube, and then maybe eventually I can turn it into a podcast or something too. I think when you look at trying to establish yourself in any endeavor, not you, but just in general, yeah. you have to find, and we talked about this about my channel, MMA, how I'm sort of distinguishing myself as being Canadian only content. And yeah. I kind of leaning toward the idea that if you want to get people to look at you, you have to distinguish yourself from others because how many MMA podcasts are out there? How many YouTube channels oh, no, are out there talk, talking about shows? There's a lot, right? So how do you set yourself apart? And I think, without having given it any more thought than just our conversation right now, I think what separates you from a lot, many, is that you're a, a very, just like people talk about for us, your brother, very cerebral and very well thought out. I mean, you, it's not, to me, you, your viewpoints are not usually spur the moment or a, a flash bit of information. It's something that you've taken the time to, to mull over and consider and look at other options and other possibilities and stuff. So I think that's probably a, a really good thing and something people might want to watch. Yeah, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. And then it's just, I feel like the, the way I've been taught by my mentors, you know, that's how they are. And I try to emulate them as much as possible. 
And if you want to increase prob your probability to be successful, you have to take the time to do your research and think things through and play out the different uh, scenarios that, that could arise, you know? And uh, it's yeah. important to think always in, for the future. Right? What's next? What's the next thing? Like, how can you improve? How can you be ready for five yeah. years ahead? Yeah. One of the things when I used to uh, train junior leaders in the military, I would say to them something along the lines of, you have to make a decision. Say you have a, a, a task ahead of you or a question ahead of you you need to answer or something. At some point, you need to come up with a decision. I'll give you a timeline and then I want an answer or I want a plan for your, your course of action. So when they come to me with a plan of action or they execute an action, they make a decision, I tell them that it might be the wrong decision. But as mm -hmm. long as in the moment you make that decision based on all the information you have at the time, your decision is still the correct decision, even if it's the incorrect decision ultimately. So some people yes. have a hard time wrap, wrapping their heads around that because well, how can I be right and wrong at the same time? Right? Well, you yes. can because, you know, sometimes it, it takes reflection and, and has, historical analysis to be able to determine if something was probably the best course of action. But as long as you go into it with a, with a good heart and a clear mind and a plan of action that makes sense with your time and, and your maybe say your, your, your group that you, your, your sphere of influence that you discuss it with, it's always the right yeah. decision. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that's the same thing with fighting. That's what's so mm -hmm. interesting about MMA because when you're the one, when you're fighting in there, both guys are trained and ready to fight each other. They've both strategized. They both have their plans. They both have their tactics. And now they're going in there and they're processing the information that their opponent is giving them. Okay, they're, they're, they're processing the range, the speed of their opponent, all the different factors, and they have to make a decision. And sometimes you jab when you should have shot, or you shot when you should have kicked, and it backfires on you. But you saw something there, and it made yep. you react, you know, because you're, yep. you're, you're processing with your subconscious, right? In, in the moment, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be thinking, you shouldn't be conscious, because consciousness is too slow. You need to be working with your supercomputer. And in that moment, you could make the right decision or the wrong decision. And looking back, it's always 2020. Oh, yeah, when I watched the replay, yeah, how did I not notice this? How did... But there's so much, there's such a large feed of information when you're staring across your opponent. Plus, in the back of your mind, you have an idea of how much time is left in the round. You have your yeah. coaches yelling stuff at you. You have the crowd. You have all these different things going on. So you have all these variables and nobody can calculate 100% of the variables in all of the in, each decision they make so you're always working with probability man and there's going to be a chance where you get it wrong yeah yep. there's going to be a chance and you have to accept it same thing with business same thing with anything you do in life you can only be truly free if you can hold that concept of you make the best choice you can at the time and you live with the consequences that's, that's it right that's right yeah prime example of what you just said uh the ability to read your opponent was alex morgan against alexander horshnik at the last samurai mma i don't yeah. know if you saw that but it, it was yeah. really early, early on the fight and alex morgan saw horshnik's movements and the way he positioned his body and he set him up and he and he head kicked him and knocked him out and he told me afterward and then he did a like a post video that showed how he set that up it was it was all part of the plan so my question to you is yeah. how good is your ability to decipher an enemy inside the cage and action your plan against that enemy. Well, yeah. Listen, the the you know over the years my my approach has changed. I feel like very early on in my career, I used to stick very rigidly to the game plan. Okay, and it made a lot of sense because the quality of opponents weren't the same as they are now, and it was easier for me to game plan specifically for them because they wouldn't change much of how they would fight me. And they weren't thinking about changing towards me. They were just fighting as themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I'm at a point where everybody's so good in the UFC and they're, everyone has good coaches and good teams and, you know, and, you know, they have a good support system that they also plan for me. Right. So what I'm doing now is I'm coming in with more of a loose game plan. Mm -hmm. I have like a general strategy that I'm expecting them how to fight or how to come at me, how I expect them to come at me. And I plan for that. But I need to keep a flexibility of mind that they might come at me with a different approach. Because like with Tercios and with uh, Eric Key Lang, they both approached me differently than we expected. But because I had that ability to just work on the fly as well, 
I adapted and I made it work for myself, you know? Like I really just came up with the openings that I saw in the moment and I just went with it and I got the results that I did. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And it's it's so funny how life works out sometimes. Like we talked before the interview about like a consciousness to the universe or a religion or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so I saw something today, just a meme or a, a page from a comic book on Facebook, I think I saw that applies directly to this conversation. It was a pic, you know, the Marvel character, Black Panther. It was yes. a, it was, a, it was a, a, a picture from a page from the Black Panther comic book. And it showed Black Panther. Okay. who was like this tall standing against this yeah. enemy. It was like this tall. He's like a big monster kind of guy. Yeah. And the monster says to like Black Panther says something like, I'm going to beat you because I've been studying you for so long. And Black Panther responds saying, well, then you've already lost because, well, you've been training to fight me. I've been training to fight uncertainty. Ah, so that's genius. I that's just saw awesome. that today. Like, yeah, that's, so that's interesting. great. That's amazing. That's a beautiful one, man. Yeah. That's yeah, really, that's really cool. Yeah. But that's what you have to do, right? Because what, what happens is he, I might show up and be something he didn't expect. And he might show up and be something I didn't expect. And that's, and if yeah. you're, if you're too, rigid on your game plan you might lose your confidence in that first few moments of the fight and then you're like oh my god i trained for this for one specific scenario and then i don't have any backup plans that can really hurt the yeah. ego in there and then it might break the it might break the guy so now i'm trying to come in with more flexibility of mine and uh, i'm ready to adapt for anything you can see that often in, in in the fight game and fights when you watch two two fighters square off with each other and one obviously is trying their best. That they're doing their move, whatever that is, or they're doing their thing. Yeah. And it's just not effective. And you can see it in their face. You can see it. they don't know what to do. Like they've they've yeah. done what they thought was going to work. It didn't work, and now they're lost. They're like, "What do I do now?" That's got to be a terrible yeah. feeling. Yeah. So it's very important to have a deep game as well, because you can't do that while having layers through your game, right? So you know, like when 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 GSP used to be in training camps, we'd always watch his opponents right we'd study his opponents and we would figure out okay what's their a game oh that's their a game we're not fighting there at all there's, mm. there's no way gsp is gonna let this fight play out in their yeah. a game yeah. we're gonna take it to their b game and their c game and some of them don't have a, a c game you know so if you take them out of their, their a and b they're done they're cooked yeah right so that's kind of like what we try to figure out you know that's how we approach the fights yeah for sure well, let's talk about your fight this weekend, I guess next weekend, against yes. Javid Basharat at the UFC Fight Night in Las Vegas. What do you expect from Javid Basharat when he comes and he faces you across the cage? You know, I feel like, you know, he's got uh, really good striking and uh, he likes to finish the rounds. He likes to shoot uh, at least once or twice in a round. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm expecting to do that. Like, he's, a, he's an MMA fighter. He's well-rounded. So I'm expecting him to kind of want to do a little bit of everything in there. And uh, I'm excited to see uh, who's got a deeper game, me or him. You know, hopefully I got a few surprises for him uh, this weekend. And I'm excited to, to show the world my skill set and uh, how deep I can go. Sorry, you froze there for a second. Are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, just, I just heard you say and you're excited to show your skill set. But we'll, we'll go on from there. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, no so, uh, so then... I took a look at his record. I, I wasn't too familiar with him uh, before yep. uh, being announced to fight you. So I did some research and it looks like he's a, a well-rounded fighter. I took a look at his opponents he's had in the past. It seems like his past little while in the UFC anyway, after the contender series, he's got, had a difficulty finishing. Uh, you know, he's got three decisions yep. in a row and that's the opposite from you, right? Like you've had decisions in your career, but you also have a lot yep. of fit, not only just finishes, but really hardcore, beautiful finishes, knockouts and yep. things like that. Where do you, yeah. I mean, can you do MMA math with, with you and opponent? Is that something you're able to do? Or is that something that you don't even bother trying? Like, I, don't even bo I, I don't bother trying because it's so, it, everyone's so unique. Everyone's got their own little special things. I would love to finish Javid, but you know, he, it seems like he takes punches pretty well. Like uh, Trevor Jones hit him with some big shots. Uh, Mendoza hit him a couple of times with some big shots. Different guys have hit him and he seems to take it on the chin pretty well. So, but you know, like I knocked out Eric Lang and Eric Lang had ever been KO'd. So yeah. that's, that, you know, obviously my dream is to knock him out. Like I want to be known yeah. as a knockout guy. I want to be known as a switch hitter. I want to be able to hit guys from softball and orthodox and hurt them with both hands, both legs. You know, that's something I want to be known for. Uh, obviously, like I do get some knockouts. I've gotten, I think, uh, eight, eight finishes by 
by uh, or seven finishes by knockout. I'm not even sure how many, but it's really coming on stringing along. But he's a he's a, he's more of a decision guy so far in the UFC. You mm-hmm. know, I think I think that uh, this fight, you know, there's a good chance it goes all the way because he's very durable, and I feel like I'm durable too. Mm-hmm. But I got, I'm bringing the power to this fight. I feel like he's more like when it comes to striking, he's more of a volume guy, and I'm more of a power puncher. Mm-hmm. And I think the power is going to be on my side. The volume is going to be on his side. We're going to see who can like edge the other run out with their specialty. Yeah, for sure. As your career is evolving and you're becoming a different person and a different fighter, where do you think you are right now compared to your your ultimate, your final form? When you have like, when you stop fighting, presumably you're going to be your ultimate level wherever you're going to be at some point. How close are you yeah. to that to that point right now? I feel like we're getting there, but I feel like I'm in my peak. I feel great. I still feel young. I don't feel like uh, I don't feel like I've lost a step in terms of like speed, performance, or anything like that. And I feel like I'm just getting better. And uh, I still got a few couple of years to go. I feel like I feel great. I feel amazing. I feel like I we're inching mm-hmm. we're inching ourselves closer and closer to that perfect form. And I think too that you're not especially active as compared to some other fighters who fight like three or four times a year. You've paced it out a lot more, and I think that's probably a good thing for your body. Like it just allows you to sort of rest a little bit and and just let your body heal and not have that full stress. So that's probably a good thing too. I'm guessing. Yeah, it's good because I I haven't taken the damage while getting to my perfect form. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like I didn't take a lot of beatings as I'm getting better over time. And then eventually my body falls apart on me. Like I still feel youthful in my age. Like I don't feel old. And now that I'm getting so good, it might be easier now to string fights together that I'm, I'm a much better fighter now. Mm-hmm. And as you're progressing in your career and you're getting more fights and, and more wins, that's something I'm sure the UFC will try to accommodate and get, get you more fights, especially with success because they have so many fighters these days. Some fighters, it seems like they take like a long time between fights just because the opportunity is not there. If you could choose in your perfect world, how, how often would you fight? Two, two or three times a year would be perfect. That would be like now with my, with my ability, with my mindset, like I've matured so much and I feel like I'm finally getting used to having the fights come in and I feel much more like a veteran and I feel like it's very normal now to have the fight you know, that I would prefer like to have two to three fights a year now. For sure. I saw another uh, quick clip of one of your, your interviews recently, and you, you talk about reading. How much does reading, do, like, do you actually read physical books or do you listen to audio books? And if so, are there any yeah. that you're focusing on right now? I used, I used to read a lot of the actual physical book, but now with audio books, they have so many books on their playlist that it's much easier to do uh, yeah. audio books. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm not, uh, reading anything for, right now for this fight, but, uh, recently I had just reread the, um, the alchemist. I love that book. Oh yeah. Yeah. Beautiful it's a really book. nice book to reread. And, uh, it's just, it's like a nice, it's a nice story that helps with like just life in general and to learn that, you know, you know, things, good things are going to come and bad things are going to come and you just got to roll with the punches type of thing. So it's like a nice, yeah. it's a nice story that helps you get ready to that mindset where, you just give it your best and, you know, you deal with with things as they come up. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Eamon, uh, I don't have any more questions for you, my man. That was an excellent chat. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. So Eamon Zahabi fighting Jafid Basharat at UFC Fight Night in Vegas this weekend. Good luck, Eamon. Thank you very much. Okay there, fight friends. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, once again, please, if you have any ideas to help me grow this channel, I'd like to encourage you to just message me or leave a comment in the link down below uh, on YouTube or wherever you see this and just give me any suggestions for people you want to hear me speak with or any ideas for the show, any segments. Uh, I'd like to grow this somehow organically and involve you in it because, uh, you know, this is two part, right? Like, and I mentioned this with, with Amen when we talked, you know, talking about growing my channel and growing my channel be nice. Yes. But even if the channel doesn't grow more than is now, I still get out of it what I want, right? Like I'm doing this for you to some degree, but I'm also doing this mostly for me. I love doing this. I enjoy doing this. And Canadian MMA is, is very niche, right? So I know I'm never going to be at the point where the whole world is watching this channel with, with bated breath. 
But uh, for the people who like Canadian MMA, I think it's a, it's a good spot to go to. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I will see you next week and enjoy the fights.